Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Abuna Michael just spoke about transformation, transformation of ourselves through the Orthodox faith. Abraham Achen talked about the transfiguration. And one of the things that is really important about the transfiguration story is the response of the apostles, of Peter, James, and John, where Peter's wanting to stay there. He wants to relish in this experience of the transfiguration. This is huge. This is a huge revelation. He just wanted to stay there. Lord, let us build three booths, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you. And what was Jesus' response to that? <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. We don't need to stay here. We need to get down the mountain. There is work to be done. It's not about you knowing who I am only. It's about us doing the work that the Father has sent us to do. We got to get down the mountain. There's work to do. So I want to talk about transformation, not just of ourselves, but the transfiguration also of the communities in which we live. The transfiguration of the communities in which we live. Because if we're not transforming the people around us and being that light on the hill for them to, in operating differently in a very distinct way, then we're not doing what we ought to. So orthodoxy is ours. It's ours. It's all of ours. And what does that mean? And I was asked to talk about how we can um, really take the orthodoxy that is ours and show others that we do have something special. Because we do. We do. We know it, perhaps in our heart of hearts. We feel it. But how do we demonstrate that specialness of being orthodox in a particular way, Christians, to the rest of the world? So one of the questions I was asked to address is, why is this the golden age of orthodoxy? Is it really the golden age of orthodoxy? Who really believes this is the golden age of orthodoxy? Orthodoxy has many golden ages. Like, we're, we don't have the Cappadocian fathers going around anymore. Where are the theologians, the great fathers of our church? We have fathers. We have saints. In the Armenian church, we've lost this tradition of having saints until recently. We've canonized the martyrs of the genocide. But it seems as though there is this old stuff that existed before us, this tradition that's been passed down to us, and that stands in tension with the newness of our lives today. And this gets us into a lot of trouble, and I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you a lot. And I'm not going to spare my own church in this at all. In fact, I'm going to be harshest, perhaps, on my own. But there are things like this going on. Anybody know these, these folks here? You might see even one of them today. This is Scooch, Standing Conference of Oriental Orthodox Churches. This is huge. I don't know if you understand the meaning of Copts and Armenians and Syrians and Indians and Ethiopians and Eritreans, the fullness of the Oriental Orthodox faith, all getting together. When has this ever happened before? When has this ever happened before in the history of the Orthodox Church where we've all been together in one place? There was a time where there was some more communality and some interplay uh, between the, the jurisdictions, the different uh, sort of flavors of the Oriental Orthodox faith. But you see these sorts of things going on too. The one conferences, these are from uh, 2014 and 16, I believe. This started off with three of us getting together. John Malik, um, Vijay Achin, Abraham, and myself got together, and we were trying to figure out how to bring the youth of all of our traditions together. Started off with three of us. Kind of has a sort of, you know, I don't want to read too much, don't read too much into this, but it sort of has the feel of the, the, the apostles being sent out, right? Starts with Jesus, one to 12 or 11, then plus one and then with all of the disciples, and then everybody else. And here we are today, millions and millions of Christians all over the world. Starts off with three of us. Then we had this conference, this sort of leadership conference, before the one conferences in Fairlawn, back in 2011. Maybe some of you were there. From there it grows, and it's 
grown like wildfire. You see hundreds and hundreds. Maybe some of you were at these events. Hundreds and hundreds of youth. There's actually a problem in these pictures, though. And I'm going to point out a lot of problems. I'm going to offer some, some formulations for solutions, of course, steeped in Scripture, steeped in the fathers. But there's a problem in these photographs. In both of these, there are hundreds of cops, hundreds of Indians. In the top picture, I think there were five Armenians. In the bottom picture, there might have been three. There's a problem. The Armenian church has a problem. And we need your help. So part of this is, as a representative of my church, is to really solicit, to beg your help for bringing our youth to Jesus. Because we need him. Our youth don't know him very well, and our church is struggling to bring him and his presence to Armenian youth, and indeed to most of the Armenian people. There was this time back in the 12th century, um, this place called the Black Mountain in Cilicia. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, but it's a very lesser known place, except that it was very special for the Armenians, for the Syrians, for Georgians, because we were all together in this particular space. We even had some Catholics running around, right? The Crusades had just happened, or were in the process of happening. So you got Catholics in here too. You've got these four groups of Christians in one place. I asked you, when has stuff like Scooch happened before? This is as close as we get to it in our history. Nearly a thousand years ago, we've got this kind of overlap geographically where we can have the theological, the liturgical overlap, and the sort of cross-pollination that we can enjoy today just by virtue of visiting so-and-so's parish down the street. So Sevler, as it's called in Armenian, the Black Mountain, was a really important time for Armenians when manuscripts were being copied, liturgy was changing, and this cross-pollination was going throughout all of these churches. Nowadays, we have a lovely place up in Yonkers, New York, called St. Vladimir Seminary. This is a special place. Why? Because not only are the Eastern Orthodox coming here, and then first the Armenians start going there, now you even have cops that are going here, Indians that are going here. We're all sharing the same space, the same table, and it presents many opportunities for dialogue and for cross-pollination again. This is partly why we are living the golden age of orthodoxy. We haven't had this before, this kind of relationship, even between Oriental and Eastern Orthodox. And already you're going to start to sense a tension, right? Because there are divisions in the church. So what are the truths of orthodoxy? Abraham Hutchin started talking about this. But the truths of orthodoxy, the truth of orthodoxy, we can point to the creed, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Okay, here are our truths. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Pantocrator, all of this stuff, maker of heaven and earth. These are the truths. We all know this. We can recite it. Great. <laughs> what does it mean for me? What does it mean for my church? What does it mean for my people? What does it mean for my neighborhood, my community, my neighbors? So what, I believe, all of this stuff, this high-flown theological stuff? What's the practical meaning here? It seems so foreign. It seems so old. Why? How is this relevant? Is it even really relevant to how I live my daily life? Well, absolutely it is. Because it's exactly in how we live our daily lives that we live the Orthodox faith, that we live the truth, truth of Orthodoxy. And it is none other than in communality, in union, that we demonstrate to the world that we can be that light on the hill for the rest of the world to show that we've got something special. We just have a different, distinct way of doing things that is not the way that the world operates. We operate very differently as Orthodox Christians. And how? Well, it's hard to say when We've got divisions in the church, okay? <laughs> Here we go. We've got divisions in the Syriac church with the Malankaras. Are you Malankara Syrian or Syrian Malankara? Which one are you? This is awful. This pains our Lord. 
to no end. What are we doing? How can we be a light on the hill? If we can't even get along with each other, how can we demonstrate to others the power of Jesus' love, His message of the cross to the rest of the world, if we can't demonstrate that to ourselves, our own people? Who are we? What are we doing here? All of the fighting, all of the violence, it's awful. It's pathetic. And it's got to stop. And how can it stop? I'm going to offer some advice. In the Coptic Church now, you're dealing with some friction, right? I hear about all of this stuff about the music, right? And Protestantism and these influences and, um, you know, certain priests' names get thrown, o uh, thrown around when it comes to being open to the way that the Spirit can move in the church. And a lot of resistance to that. And there's a lot of conflict. How can we be a light in the world if there's so much conflict amongst ourselves? How can we do that? Well, we need new music because the old stuff isn't really reaching the young people. It's not really relevant. It's foreign. It's strange. We need to reach out in, in an effort, actually, to reach out to our communities, to non-cops. Right? We're going to use this music to draw them into the faith. And then we'll do a whole like bait and switch sort of thing where now we're going to go and we're going to have the symbols and the triangles and they're going to get the beats and all of the makams and all of this that are inherent in the tradition. And then they're going to be exposed to this old stuff that is really the meat of the church, right? <laughs> well, the old stuff, is it really that inaccessible? Is the new stuff really going to lead people to the old stuff? What are we really doing here with these divisions? Can we take a step back and instead of looking at each other and blaming each other and getting mad at each other and all of this conflict, can we take a step back and start looking at Jesus? So how can we help each other out? We've got Nerses Meds in the Armenian church. Uh, he was a 6th to 7th century saint who built hospitals, um, orphanages. He was all about social justice. We've got Matthew 25, and we've got the separation of the sheep and the goats. We know this story. We know this story well. Which side do we want to be on? Well, of course we want to be on the sheep side. Of course. But that means doing certain things. Feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, visiting those who are prisoners getting out of our own heads, getting out of our own communities and reaching out to those who are really, really marginalized. James says that unless our works are shown, we don't have faith. Our faith is demonstrated by our works. It's got to be faith in action. All that creedal stuff, great. What is it doing in my life? What is it doing in the lives of those around me? Golden Age of Orthodoxy again. I got to put, a, put in a plug for St. Vladimir Seminary Press. I was the bookstore manager for a little while. I'm a graduate from there. But you've got St. Basil the Great's on social justice. Don't take my word for it. Read St. Basil. St. Basil the Great on social justice. Read this. I'm going to present some quotes in just a second. Read St. John Chrysostom's on wealth and poverty. This is where our faith becomes real. The Didache is very clear. I'm going to talk about communality. I'm going to talk about union and all of this stuff coming up. The Didache says, we've got to share all things in common. Don't say anything as private property, right? Even going back to the Nicene Council, one of the lesser known things of the council, there are all these canons, right, that were written out as well. One of those mandated houses of hospitality for the poor in every single diocese. And I would challenge you to do the same today. What would it look like to have houses of hospitality around every single parish in your diocese. Armenians are pathetic at this sort of thing. The Armenian church has its own division. We're pathetic at union. How can we focus on Jesus and making his presence real in other people's lives? More on communality, more on all things belonging to God, the Father, the things that we have, the things that we're wearing, the things in our closets. The things in our homes, they don't belong to us. 
And this is radical. The rejection of private property is radical. And it's not just for monks. Sorry. It's not just for monks. It's for all of us to believe that all we have has all been given to us by God. And it sounds like a very nice thing to believe, but it becomes very real when we start rejecting that very notion. John Chrysostom said that he was constantly uh, chastised for having a bone to pick with the rich. He said that he's constantly, you know, he's constantly attacking the rich. And St. John Chrysostom's response was, well, yeah, of course I am. Because the rich continually attack the poor. He says every day the church feeds 3,000 people. How many people does your church feed on a daily basis? <laughs> How many people does my church feed on a daily basis? I imagine it's even fewer than yours. We have a lot of work to do. If only 10 people were willing to do this, there would be no, no rich and no poor. If everything were held in common, if we really believed this thing, that there is nothing in the world that is mine, it all belongs to God, how would our lives change? And it's a radical notion, again, not just for monastics. We have um, lived examples, too, in the church. Start with Dorothy Day. Back in the throes of the Great Depression, she starts this Catholic worker movement, opening up houses of hospitality, f using that mandate of Nicaea, and calls them houses of hospitality for the poor. This is in the mid 40 or in the mid uh, 1930s, she's starting this, to live the faith and not just think about it and pray about it, right? And based on this, this priest who used to be Melkite Catholic and then ended up converting to Orthodoxy, Father David Kirk, started up Emmaus House up in Harlem. It still exists today. It used to be a huge hotel that he had bought up and filled with people who had no homes, giving people who have no homes a home. Is there a, a room in your house to accept somebody else? This is, this is part of our faith. Is there a guest room where you can, you, can, you can receive somebody off of the streets? This is something I'd love to have whenever I do have a place of my own. But you can go here and you can help these people out. So I'd like to present to you a vision of the future where we're not standing in conflict with each other, where we can take a step back from these divisions in the church and say, they are wrong, and stop looking at each other Focus on our own selves. In our church, in the Armenian church, whenever we talk about sinners, it's always in the first person. I am the sinner, right? The, the canon of St. Andrew of Crete, I am the first among sinners. Help me not to judge my brother, but focus on my own sins, right? If we do that, then we're no longer looking at each other to fault each other. We're looking toward Christ, all of us looking toward Christ. And that's the only way through unity, through communion, true communion of all that we have within our neighborhoods that we're going to be able to reach out. Who is my neighbor? Someone asked. Who is my neighbor? It's not the one that looks like me. It's not the one that thinks like me. It's the one I rejected, right? The Samaritan is the one that helps the beaten man on the side of the road, not the rabbi, not the scribe, the rejected person. So when we're feeling rejected, how do we respond? Usually, we respond with anger, right? We're upset because we've been rejected, and this hurts deeply. Attachment is a real thing. I'm a psych professor. Attachment is a real thing, so when we're rejected, there's a separation and there is hurt. That's how we're built as human beings. But there has to be a sense in which there is a resolve. As there has to be a sense in which there's healing in the church, which after all, as we were talking about earlier, the church is a hospital. How is it a hospital if there's so much brokenness, if there's so much division, if there's so much hurt? We need to start living in a way that's consistent with not only Jesus' words, but also with the fathers who interpreted them and made them practical in very specific ways for us. So may God, who is the only one that can bring unity to us with each other, actually make that a reality so that we can witness not only within our churches to each other, but way, way more importantly, 
to the communities in which we live, to our neighborhoods, and make that presence of Christ that we feel, we might feel while we're in church, real whenever we step outside of the church to everyone that we meet. To the glory of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.